The Southern Professional Hockey League is a professional hockey league in the South, sort of. Here are the SPHL arenas. Starting with Palum Civic Centre, Birmingham Bulls. We've started off with the smallest arena in the league. That is in terms of the capacity. It's certainly not the smallest when it comes to the floor space of the entire venue, as it has two full-sized rinks within it. They are apparently the only proper ice rinks in the Birmingham metropolitan area, so they get a lot of use. Hang on, I've been saying Pelham, but they pronounce the H in Birmingham, so I guess it's Pelham? Pelham Civic Centre? Are the people of Birmingham consistent with their ham pronunciations? Or do they just ham it up when it comes to the name of the city? These are very important questions. Anyway, it's a pretty simple layout in here. Very compact and very small, as I said. Ford Center, Evansville Thunderbolts. I never knew that Indiana was considered to be a part of the South. You learn new things every day. India is South Asia, so it does make sense that Indiana is South America. Geography time with the wide world of stadiums. Before the Thunderbolts arrived at this venue, it was home to the Evansville Icemen of the East Coast Hockey League, who have since moved to Jacksonville. Unlike the last one, this does have a lot going on inside. The layout is a little bit unconventional. There's one big bowl of regular seating, with premium seating above on the sidelines. Which means there are these big walls of concrete where there's no premium seating. I like that though. Being the only venue in this league that was built in the 21st century, it comes as no surprise that it has the most modern amenities. Crown Coliseum, Fayetteville Marksman. Crown Coliseum is part of the Crown Complex, which also includes the Crown Theatre, the Crown Ballroom and the Crown Arena, which is basically this venue's predecessor. But the complex's crowning achievement is the Crown Coliseum. I guess I'm slightly disappointed that it doesn't look like a giant crown from outside, but then again that would be a little ostentatious. Maybe if Rolex ever decides to sponsor the arena, anyway. Crown Theatre and Crown Arena will be closing next year, but much like the Colosseum in Rome, this one will be around for thousands of years. In the year 3248, there will be tour groups wandering through here, reflecting upon the horrors that went on inside the building. How can they be so barbaric to those poor pucks? Now, Margaret, we mustn't judge them. They did not yet know that hockey pucks were sentient beings. Von Braun Center, Huntsville Havoc. You may have heard of those Nazi scientists that went on to work for NASA after the war, Operation Paperclip. Well, Werner von Braun, whom this arena is named after, was one of them. It might seem controversial, but you know, if your options are to design weapons for the Nazis or death, most people would choose the former in reality. It's not rocket science. Well, yeah. The Marshall Space Flight Center is based in Huntsville, so that's the local connection. Anyway, enough about that. The interior design here is almost the same as the last one. It's just that the second tier of seating is continuous. And those sitting in the upper tier at the ends are sitting right on top of the ice, basically. Knoxville Civic Coliseum, Knoxville Ice Bears. Having opened in 1961, this is the oldest arena in the league, and it certainly does look its age. Both the exterior and interior are looking a bit drab. Although there are surprisingly few wrinkles, so it obviously has some work done. That scoreboard is certainly not 1960 technology. I've been talking a lot about seating layouts, I know, but here there is only an upper tier at the ends, no lower tier so it really is right on top of the ice. That might mean that those sitting in some seats can't see all of the rink. There are also a few hundred seats in the corners which must have pretty bad sight lines. But most 63 year olds do have poor sight, so I guess that makes sense. Macon Coliseum, Macon Mayhem. I'm slightly disappointed that they didn't go with the name Macon Bacon, but then again, that might alienate their Jewish, Muslim, and vegan fan base. Also, Making Mayhem is actually a pretty good name. When this place opened, it was the largest arena in Georgia. The US state of Georgia, of course. But I don't think the Soviet Republic of Georgia would have had anything bigger at that time anyway. They certainly could have a bigger one now, but that remains to Billy C. 
The most distinctive aspect to this arena has got to be the roof. But look how high that center hung scoreboard is. Not only do you have to crane your neck, but bring binoculars as well. It is a pretty cool venue though. Pensacola Bay Center, Pensacola Ice Flyers. They say in a blind taste test, most people can't actually tell the difference between Pensacola and Coca-Cola. I'm doubtful of that though, I reckon I could tell the difference. Wow, that is a unique exterior. But I like the interior a lot more. Unlike the outside, it has this thing called color. The combination of burgundy walls and navy blue seats makes for an elegant look. Looks can be a little deceiving. There may be some issues below the surface because the study found that this place is gonna need up to $140 million in upgrades over the coming years to stay relevant. Can you spare some change, man? L look, I would, but I've got no cash. I left my wallet at home. I'm busy that day. My dog ate my homework. I really don't have anything on me. Carver Arena, Peoria Riverman. If the exterior of the last arena was for the concrete crew, then this is definitely one for the glass gang. Or the silicon squad as they're also known. Other than that, there's quite a bit of artwork about the place. Most notably this sculpture called Sonar Tide. This one's called Cedric the Dragon. Anyway, as you can see there, the arena is shared with the Bradley Braves, a Division 1 college team of the basketball variety. I don't believe that college partakes in hockey. This arena is much like the Crown Coliseum, in that it's part of a much larger complex, one called the Peoria Civic Center. It was actually built on the side of a house that was part of the Underground Railroad. Vibrant Arena at the Mark. Whoops, we missed the mark. It's home to Quad City Storm. Every day's leg day in Quad City. No, actually Quad Cities is a region that was originally comprised of four cities. Perhaps it still is, but it seems to be just one big urban area now. Speaking of names, this place has never really had a good one. Vibrant Arena at the Mark is not too bad, but before that it was Tax Slayer Center. And when I hear Tax Slayer, it just conjures up images of a really nerdy tax accountant that thinks he's a bit of a ladies' man. You know, they call me the Tax Slayer. No, they don't. Yes, they do. Look me up on Xbox, Tax Slayer 96. Tax Slayer 69 was taken. Anyway, the Quad City Storm fittingly play at one of the largest arenas in the league, and by the looks of it, they have no trouble filling it. Berglum Center. Roanoke Railyard Dogs. Something about the spelling of that name makes me want to pronounce it Roanoke. But I've definitely heard Roanoke before. Unlike most arenas that we've seen, the characteristics of the exterior are carried over to the interior here. Outside we see a rectangle of concrete. It looks very solid. Inside we see a rectangle of concrete. It looks very solid. This place is not only home to the dogs, but three college hockey teams. Although I believe they are all club level teams, so they probably don't attract much of a crowd. In fact, there's actually a Virginia Tech game going on right now. And those were the SBHL arenas. It was very difficult to pick a favorite. Ford Center clearly has the best amenities and although there are some more characterful venues, I think I still have to go with them. Who knew that Ford Sensor would be the Rolls Royce of SBHL arenas? Thanks for watching, have a good one.